Hello everyone, you are very welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is the design of composite floors, both in construction and uh, final stages. I hope you can hear me well. My name is, my name is Andres Herbe. I'm the sales manager here at the Master Series. Joining me in this webinar, Patrick McGinley. Patrick has recently joined the Master Series team as one of our technical advisor. Patrick worked for various big consultancies in the past and gained extensive experience in structural design. Before we start uh, the presentation, I would like to quickly share some practical information about the GoToWebinar tool. The control panel can be uh, hidden with the red arrow button and questions or messages can be sent with the chat option. Feel free to type in your questions at any time during the webinar. My colleagues will answer them during the session, but I will do a review the questions at the end of the webinar as well. As usual, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our channels and sent out uh, to your email address. Quickly about the agenda at first, Patrick will shortly review the benefits and types of the composite constructions. After that, he will look through the design situations, both in construction and final stages. Then he will shortly talk about the design checks. Then Patrick will talk about uh, the effect of degree of shear connections on the deflection and we'll show you uh, the usual serviceability limits. And after that, I will demonstrate how you can design composite beams and force using the master series. And of course, we will finish with a QE section. Okay, let me hand over the presentation to Patrick to talk about the background of composite floor design. Hopefully you can all see my screen there. Um, yes, thank you, Andres. Yeah, as Andres mentioned, uh, I'm Patrick McGinley. I've recently joined Master Series, uh, coming in from having spent most of my engineering career in a consultancy, and I'm a heavy Master Series user uh, in, the, in my consultancy career, so I know the benefits of the software, and hopefully that'll come across in this and many up upcoming webinars. So. Uh, feel free to engage in the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions, Andras is at hand and he'll be helping as well as taking the second part of the webinar uh, where he'll be demo demoing the Master Series design. Um, if there's any, any feedback or anything, please do please do get involved. And um, as Andras says, this will, will be posted up on YouTube, uh, Vimeo, and our, and our website later on. So. Uh, I'll just mention we do have a preview webinar which Martin O'Gara, the director and lead developer, has uh, showed off some of the new features in our composite designer. It's maybe worth checking out. Um, but the aim for this talk is to understand, uh, separate to the Master Series software, uh, this could almost be treated as a standalone webinar, but the, really the process of design uh, for the composite decking and beams. And not just design as in beam calculations, I mean, design is in really understanding everything from construction and conceptual stage before you begin the model. Anything in Master Series um, hopefully uh, will help you develop uh, your engineering career. So, um, so, I'll be heavily referencing throughout to the SCA P359 uh, publication and SCA P300. Um, and the first ch six chapters there, uh, I'll be heavily referencing to. So, a reminder of our the structural engineer's role in composite design. So, it's our, our responsibility to specify the form of decking, the arrangement, the details, materials, and con quantities required for the composite beams, sheeting, studs, reinforcement, and concrete. So, with the consideration of temporary works as well, and the form of propping were required alongside fire design and any site-specific safety measures, so it's, it's no mean task for, for the designer. Um, I'll quickly just show a uh, a sequence uh, where we've got our steel beams and uh, frame, our steel sheeting, studs, mesh reinforcement and our, and our wet concrete being poured. 
um, and also go through some of the advantages of the composite deck construction. Um, so we know steel has a huge advantage over concrete due to its speed of construction, but uh, even specifically looking at just composite decking versus precast units, for example, the, the steel decking doesn't need a crane to lift in uh, each one into position, so we would lift it in, in bundles and it can be used for working on immediately, therefore it's a much safer uh, option as well. So both precast and steel decking, they both need design consideration in the construction phase, which we will come to later, but um, uh, with composite design we get a, we get a greater server zone as well, uh, so we can incorporate other options such as castellated and cellular beams. And our two year fire resistance can be achieved without the need to protect the uh, steel decking at all. So, um, and the decking is fairly adaptable. For example, if there are size limitations, it's easier to cut a steel seat to suit, unlike precast beams where cutting may expose rebar. Um, and the arrangement of the beam spacing should be limited to, say, two and a half to three meters to keep slab thicknesses down and fire resistance is up. And the most economical arrangement is typically for the primary span to, uh, to be about three quarters of the secondary span. So I've only shown one bay here, so uh, an eight meter by six meter bay is typical. And I've got a just a single, um, a single uh, beam in there as well. So overall, composite decks are about optimization. They, they meet all the necessary structural strength and building performance needs while being efficient in the amount of material used. Um, we'll go through the process of selecting materials and what we need to know from a designer's point of view. Uh, mostly, we will look at UK beam and column sections, but we're not limited to those. Uh, you can use other class one or two sections using similar bending and shear design principles. Uh, they're required to avoid local buckling issues in the compression elements of a steel section. And, and with a master series, we can also specify channels. Um, our flange, flanges uh, are recommended to be a minimum of 150 mil wide and what's of 0.4 times the stud diameter, which is usually 90 mil, uh, which equates to about 7.6 mil thick flange. Um, and all but two UK beam sections make this flange thickness requirement. And out of interest, I had a look and they were 254 by 102 UB and a 305 by 102 UB, uh, which personally i would not really used these before as I, I, I don't really like their uh, slenderness anyway. So, um, and three, it's also possible to just introduce a symmetry into the section as the bottom flange will be providing most of the tensile resistance. Uh, this can see of weight in the top flange, again, we're thinking about the, that minimum flange width of 150 mil. And ASBs, they're also an option within master series uh, within our composite section selection, as is the selection of cellular and castellated beams, which are advantageous, especially for services and can uh, make the design even more economical due to their increased strength to weight ratio. Uh, for steel sheeting, uh, in most cases, the designer will refer to manufacturers' tables or software, which we will cover later, later, but this will serve as a good intro into the properties and different variables in the selection of the sheeting. So uh, there's some very informative product overview videos that go into detail on the numerous systems and connections from the various composite decking manufacturers, you can get them on YouTube. Um, I watched quite a few in my preparation for this. So uh, I also talked in the intro about how the steel sheeting serves as formwork on a working platform in the construction or, or the temporary stage. Um, the temporary stage typically governs the size of the sheeting, uh, but in the composite or the permanent long-term stage, uh, the steel sheeting serves as external reinforcement to resist the tension <coughs> forces where Sagging occurs at the mid span of the sheet, so uh, therefore maximum tensile forces uh, on the on the bottom bottom flange, uh, bottom face of the slab. So sheeting it's uh, extremely advantageous in both scenarios. Um, for our insulation, I've also discussed the ease of insulation, where workers can manually handle and use the deck as a platform. Uh, we'll cover relevant loading cases in the coming slides. It's also possible to prop the steel sheeting and or the beams during construction. Uh, I've squeezed in an image there uh, showing us that. And the advantage is being that this can increase the spans of the decking as the temporary case loading will likely govern the span there. I.e. having the, our workers and wet concrete on thin metal sheeting. But the disadvantage is that the loads will be taken down under the floors below and the problem requirements will need to be carried out by the structural designer, i.e. us. And propping, it's not usually preferred on site either as it slows the whole construction process down. Um, our, Sheeting profiles are either re-entered or trapezoidal, uh, referring to uh, 3A there, uh, re-entered at the bottom and trapezoidal at the top. 
And to, I've used a 50 to 60 mil deep around three meters unsupported and goes all the way up to 200 mil deep and they can span around six meters unsupported. And for increased resistance, we can introduce um, additional reinforcement in our decking troughs there as well. So uh, grade three, uh, S350 is most commonly used um, for the decking and it's usually around one mil. Uh, as, uh, I've only ever, ever seen it as low as 0.7 mil and the, the dimples you see there are known as embossments and they trap the concrete locally around the profile allowing for interlocking. And finally, for corrosion protection, we have zinc coating of around one kilogram over four meters squared, uh, both sides. And that's suitable for uh, most non-aggressive cases. Uh, it's worth noting, protective paint uh, is not suitable prior to welding due to the heat of the process and effect it might have on the paint locally, uh, i.e. blistering. Um, and our shear studs, uh, their role is to enable the concrete and steel elements together to act compositely as one structural member uh, once the concrete is set. So simply it can be thought of like casting bolts and it avoids the two elements pulling or sliding away from each other. So you can see that in the in the diagram here where uh, where we don't have steer, uh, shear studs, we can see the slip forming. And as mentioned previously, we usually specify 90 mil diameter studs as it's the only practical size when it come, comes to through sheet welding. And most contractors have that uh, type of gun to, to use uh, that, that uh, stud size. Um, the design lengths usually are about 10 mil shorter than the initial stud length based on the through sheet welding method. And you can refer to the table there. Uh, the length after the weld should have about 15 mil concrete cover to the stop, top studs. Um, our reinforcement there, uh, it's usually uh, in the form of mesh most times. And the fu its function is to reduce and control cracking at the sports which occurs because of flexural tension and different differential shrinking effects. It strengthens the edges of openings. It provides bending resistance at the supports of the slab in the fire condition when the concrete zone goes under tension, i.e. hogging over the beam. Um, and we can see there, uh, our transverse reinforcement runs perpendicular to the beam and is required in the concrete flange of composite beams to resist splitting forces. Um, Master Chase software designed to transport transverse reinforcement there as well. So uh, the, the the reinforcement also helps distribute the effects of localized point and line loads as well. Um, our mesh property, so the reinforcement industry in the UK has decided to standardize and grade 500C reinforcement steel, which satisfies our your code requirements for our mesh reinforcement. And we should uh, comply with British standards 4483 for fabric uh, or BS4449 for bars. We, we don't usually specify less than A142 mesh and it would come on standard sheet sizes of 2.4 by 4.8 meters. Um, the reinforcement, it's usually laid using chairs and it should be su uh, supported sufficiently high enough above the top of the decking to allow for concrete placement around the bars. So the required top cover depends on the concrete class and the exposure. Um, so onto the selection of our concrete. We know the concrete performs well in compression, so the concrete obviously lies in the compression zone of the composite section. Uh, we can elaborate a bit in the stress diagrams later. Uh, it helps keeping the floor stiff. It's advantageous in fire protection and thermal storage properties, and but we should put consideration into the construction joints and their location, uh, and they should be put uh, as close to the decking joints as possible. Uh, one side of the shear studs to ensure we can get the concrete around the studs. And with that uh, joint continuity will usually be in the form of reinforcement or mesh. It usually will be at these locations unless unless you're using fiber reinforcement, then you'll need rebar to provide that continuation. Um, we can use lighter concrete uh, that saves about 25% on weight and has better fire properties. But we do make sacrifices in the form of uh, our deflections and our stud resistance capacities. Uh, stud resistance capacity is reduced by about 10%. I'm not too sure about the deflections, so uh, it may be worth checking out. Um, so the requirements and recommendations are listed for lightweight and normal concretes uh, shown there, um, but bear, worth bearing in mind that lightweight concrete is not always available throughout the UK. 
Um, we don't usually have any uh, issues with aggregate because of the small round of pellets used in uh, lightweight concrete, but for normal concrete, we would go for 20 mil uh, to uh, allow us to get into smaller spaces and avoiding increasing our cement concrete, uh, or sorry, or in increasing our cement content, which could increase shrinkage performance of the concrete. And precast planks, although maybe easier in the permanent stage, from uh, our, our perspective as a designer, they're less effective in a number of ways, uh, but we won't get into them here today. So, onto the deck loading at the different stages. So, we can see there our construction stage loaded first. So, construction stage conditions can create problems if we're not careful. And in my experience, I've been tasked to provide remedial works on projects where the stage is not properly planned or executed. Um, and I think they could have been easily avoided if the construction stage was better understood, uh, maybe more diligence taken in that process. So it's important for designers and contractors to be aware of issues in the stage. So looking at the table, what jumps out uh, is the fact that in the construction phase, the concrete is wet, i.e. non-structural. Uh, so it's only only a load, and it's a live load at that. So we're relying on just their, uh, a one mil steel sheeting for our temporary support. Um, and also our, our, our ponding. So uh, bear that in mind, if we go through our actual loading on the sheeting, uh, we can see the permanent loads, uh, which are the steel sheeting and the reinforcement there, and our live loads being the wet concrete, the ponding concrete, which we'll cover, and the general construction loads and a movable patch load, which uh, if we look, it's greater of, the greater of 10% of slab Self weight or 0.75 kilograms per meter squared, and that's over a three by three uh, meter working area, and that should be applied to cause maximum effect, i.e., the most unfavorable case for the designer for uh, the or checks. Um, P300, I think, goes into what what we should be considering for the movable patch load, and I've shown quite uh, a, a nice wee graphic there <laughs> to give you an idea of what what will be considered. Um, I mentioned ponding in the previous slide. So if you can imagine the process of ponding, uh, we've got flexible sheets and beams and a moving liquid attracted to the point of greatest deflection. Uh, and that's that continues. So we have a bandage, a bending beam or a sheet, it's attracting liquid concrete. We're, we're creating ponding, which is make, creating greater deflection in the beam or the sheet, which then attracts more liquid concrete and uh, the, the cycle continues and the, the, the deflections can get uh, significant there if it's not on, under control. So if the deflection of the steel sheeting is greater than one-tenth of the slab depth, the effect of ponding should be considered, otherwise it, it may be ignored. And where it is, uh, an allowance is made, the depth of the con concrete should be increased by uh, a factor of 0.7, uh, W1, where W1 is the maximum the vertical deflection of the steel sheeting at the wet concrete stage, and that should be treated as a variable action. So. I've also included an example calculation of that might help you get an idea of the numbers involved there. Um, it should be noted <coughs> that where laser leveling techniques are employed for floor levels, uh, the slab depth will be greatly influenced by the selection of the beams and sheeting. An alternative leveling technique is through constant thickness as opposed to constant level. So worth, uh, worth bearing that in mind. And likewise for beam or beam loading, uh, our, our, the loading conditions are very similar, except we take into account the self weight of the beam, and it suggested that with good site control, the movable patch load could be neglected for the beam, um, and that's the responsibility of the de designer to make the contractor aware of these assumptions. Um, deflection due to ponding usually just governs the design, support the wet concrete, and the construction loads, which I'll talk about, um, and we usually take an absolute limit of 25 mil to avoid allowing for ponding in the beam design, but ponding is considered, uh, I'll quickly summarize here, uh, the quote from SCIP 359, taking into account the constant level leveling technique. The slab thicknesses for the design of secondary beams increase, is increased by up to 70% of the beam deflection plus 70% of the deflection of the sheeting and up to 100% of the deflection of the primary beams, so that's for the secondary beams. And for the design of primary beams, it increases 70% of the combined deflections of the sheeting, primary and secondary beams. So um, again, I've included some sample calculations here, but 
again, rather than crunching numbers, it's, it's more to get a, a, an understanding of the, the deflections there. Uh, for designing our stage heating, this is usually done by the manufacturers based on testing that they've carried out. Um, so, uh, depending on the floor geometry, single span sheets can be used, but design, the design is more beneficial for continuous sheeting. Um, as I say, design criteria are based on testing results done within the various manufacturers, uh, which usually lends itself to less conservative resistances than being based just off calculations. So we can get our values from tables based on our inputs and then we can specify our likely arrangement and final design developed alongside guidance from the manufacturer or supplier. Um, and these are all the different uh, variables or parameters that we can uh, use. And we've also got another option where we can download some free software from, from the manufacturers just to, just to get an idea of the, the, the sheeting sizes. Um, so Eurico 3 gives rules for the verification of the resistance of staging sections of members. So for 1A here, when the span of the sheeting runs perpendicular to the beam, we've got full restraint. And for 1B, for parallel spanning sheets, the beam will only be restrained at its ends uh, and beam-to-beam -beam connection. So we'll take the buckling resistance based on the length between the points of restraint and verifying resistance of the cross section. So um, your, your, your beam calculations can be done manually or or using software such as such as master series, but uh, in most cases when using steel sheets, torsion is negligible during the casting of the concrete. Uh, unlike with, for example, if we're using pre-gas planks and then temporary versus our, our permanent conditions, which can cause issues. Um, again, uh, leveling techniques are important at the construction stage. Uh, uh, I've mentioned before, steel beams we can simply limit to 25 mil for flood pouring to reduce our ponding effects and for our steel sheeting. Um, if ponding is considered based on uh, sheet deflection, add 75% of that deflection on the slab thickness for design. So again, um, some some quick calculations. So with ponding or sheeting, uh, we've got a span over 130 or 30 mil, whichever is uh, smaller. And without ponding, span over 180 and 20 mil. Um, so we've talked about the construction stage uh, loads, now on their composite stage loads where uh, we can see now that the concrete has cured, it's now contributing structurally to the deck and has moved into the permanent load category and we've got a, we've got a supporting deck structure of a, 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 of a composite deck rather than just a, a stage sheeting. So we obviously have no construction loading now, nor movable patch load, but we do have occupancy and partition loads. Um, the finish off, we'll get on the behaviour of beams and shear studs and get an understanding of how they work at the permanent stage. Now, um, referring to our boxed red beam down here, the, the amount of concrete available to resist the compressive force due to bending is limited by its effective width. So you can see that at the midpoint where maximum bending uh, occurs, the effective width of the concrete is the greatest, reducing over the last quarter uh, of the beam to the support. Um, just it's 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 also recommended to avoid putting any holes in the zone, as you're uh, reducing the effective width of the concrete flange, and this can seriously affect your design, and may reduce the design flange width to the inside face of that opening. Um, and elastic design, a constant width of length over four can typically be used along with full width. Um, another note, if we look at the top, when considering the bending resistance of the composite section, the tensile resistance of the concrete is ne neglected below the neutral axis, and the profile steel sheeting is ignored when in compression. So I've highlighted that here in yellow. Um, yes, uh, so there's there's no no action from the, the concrete or the, or the decking there. So all three diagrams on the left here are plastic stress di distribution diagrams. When the shear studs are fully utilised, i.e. when the studs capacity to transfer the force is greater than the force that has the concrete feeling in compression or the steel beam feeling in tension. Um, the top diagram represents a typical secondary beam and the bottom two diagrams show a typical primary beam and on occasions the steel section actually offers more tension resistance than the concrete flange can match in resistance. So the neutral axis moves down to the flange of the steel section or as low as the web here. 
we can also ignore the tensile resist resistance of the concrete and compression resistance of the sheeting again, except this time when we're below the shear stunt level. Um, so all of these checks are covered in the, the guides in detail as well. So, um, and finally, when the full compression resistance is not required in the concrete flange, the shear studs are sufficiently ductile and not fully utilised, we get a partial stress distribution as highlighted in the blue box over here. So um, finally, we'll talk a little bit about the shear studs. And I'll, I'll try not to get too technical or number crunchy uh, on this, but this will give you an understanding of how they work and what we're designing for. So the design resistance is a function of the shape of the decking profile, uh, the st size, strength, and number of studs per decking trough, uh, or concrete properties and the sheet thicknesses. So first, looking at how the beam acts as a whole, uh, puts load onto the studs longitudinally. So referring to the first two, two diagrams, uh, one and two, uh, we can see the, where the slip distance increases towards the ends. Uh, that equates to increased horizontal forces on the studs for cobs and slabs as we get closer to the supports. So uh, we've got effectively zero slip at the middle. Uh, which coincides with the point of greatest bending moment. And so the studs can be spaced along the beam relative to the longitudinal shear force distribution. Um, so you might have more sh shear studs at the ends. Um, for our typical spacing, we have guidance on the minimal long longitudinal spacing of the studs, which should be about 5D, and taking, taking a 90mm uh, stud, that's about 95mm, and maximum spacing should not exceed the lesser of 800 mil or six times the slab depth. Um, looking at forces locally in the studs, as we can see in diagram three, uh, the force distribution in the studs can act differently for the different types of steel sheeting and stud layouts. Uh, the bottom two examples show the trapezoidal sheets and how they require slightly more complex checks due to the, the uh, sheets profile, um, which impacts the relationship between the stud and the surrounding concrete. Also, where the stud is positioned within the trough is important, um, where we might have a central stiffener. Um, we should fix the stud on the favourable side of the trough, i.e. away from the centre, to maximise the allowable uh, concrete crushing capacity zone. And finally, if our point of maximum bending moment is located closer to the ends, we have less space to resist the horizontal shear forces that are generated, and therefore a smaller space to fit on a large number of shear studs. So, we should be aware of the impact of placing secondary beams uh, with large point loads too close to the ends of, of our primary beams. Uh, these are real design issues and uh, they need careful consideration when designing your arrangements. Um, the studs will resist some upload, uplift due to the live loads when the deck is fully cured and the tensile resistance should be about one tenth of its shear resistance. Uh, that's a requirement which our, our head of studs can easily satisfy. So. We can see the distribution of the tension of the studs along the length of the beam where it is greatest at the middle due to the beam deflecting away from the stiff concrete deck. So um, our spacing and height based on a 90 mil stud uh, transversely should not be less than 2.5 to 4 D, so around 50 mil to 75 mil. Uh, there's little point in putting more than two or three for regular beams as our shear and pull out zones will uh, overlap and they will just act as, as one block. Um, we can't come too close to the edge of the beam either, uh, so around 20 mil to the edge of the flange there. For height, we should have around uh, at least 2D, uh, around 40 mil above the top of the decking to allow for enough penetration in the concrete for the studs to be effective, and also enough cover for corrosion protection of the metal reinforcement and the studs, and tolerance of the leveling for the leveling of the surfacing as well. You don't want to be clashing with any, uh, any studs or reinforcement one of your um, on that down. So there's guidance in all these dis distances in SCI P300 and C59 as highlighted. Uh, the presence of reinforcement also near the shear studs that'll prevent the concrete from locally splitting due to the transfer of the forces from the stud into the slab. Uh, we've actually got a very good technical blog uh, Andras has done on calculating the shear connections of a composite beam to Eurocode 4 that's, that can be found on our website uh, and we can post that as well uh, whenever we post up the webinar recording. Uh, uh, so the main aim of my presentation there was to provide designers, designers a, an understanding into composite beam design and its different elements and critical stages and the roles of our, uh, us as a structural designer within it. Uh, these are just a few images here of the Master Series Composite Beam Design Module inputs, displaying some of the parameters we've just talked about and Andres might go through uh, a bit more detail on. 
Uh, with that, uh, thank you for your time, and let me pass you back over to Andras to talk a bit about the, the software. Okay, thank you, Patrick. It was very detailed and useful. So, uh, let me do my, my part in the webinar. So, uh, inside the Master Series ecosystem, we have two options to design composite beams and floors. Uh, using the Master Frame, we have the options to, to, to design uh, the composite uh, elements as a part of our uh, 3D uh, frame design. So we, this is the integrated design options, and we have a standalone version, a standalone composite uh, beam designer. Uh, using this module, uh, we can uh, design simple standalone composite beam. So let me just start with the, with the standalone version first. Okay, new model. Okay, so we are dealing with uh, a secondary beam. Mm, let's say uh, a 7.5 meter long, and we have three meters to the left and three meters to the right, uh, to the uh, to the right. And as I mentioned, this is a secondary beam, so the deck is sitting uh, on the beam, and the deck is spanning onto this beam. Okay, and we are gonna go for a four meter, let's say office live load, and we have one kilonewton per, uh, sorry, four kilonewton uh, per square meter office live load, and we have one kilonewton per square meter partitions and 0.5 uh, service load. Let's move forward uh, to the section information. So we are going to go for, for example, let's say a multi-deck uh, 80. And I'm going to increase the slab depth, my slab thickness to 140, for example. And the concrete grade is 30. Uh, yes. Okay. We are getting some warnings, as you can see. So if you see the first one, and uh, the, the warning is telling us we need uh, we need a minimum 180 height stud. And, uh, and, if we, and we can also see that we have some uh, ductility issues as well. So let's increase the, change the, uh, the stud first. So I'm gonna use uh, the 80 by one uh, 125 uh, headed stud. And if you go this, we can see, yes. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change my design code. So this is the time before I go to the design, I have to change back to the Euro code. Okay, so if you use a Euro code, you can see that the, that the, the default beam uh, works. We can change the section, the section, or we can ask the program uh, to find me, uh, find us uh, the most economical solution. So if you click on the auto design, then the program can quickly find us uh, the shallowest cross section which works. So then this is the, the 05165 uh, UV40. And if we turn on uh, the sort by weight option, then the program will find us the lightest cross section and the 406 uh, one, uh, 140 uh, UB uh, 39 is the is the lightest uh, cross section. Okay, let's take a, a deeper look of the the detailed uh, design. So as we can see, uh, the program calculate both the composite and the non composite composite stages, either for the for the ultimate states. Uh, and the uh, and the uh, the serviceability uh, serviceability states, unless the the construction is is probed, but now we have an unprobed uh, construction. In the construction in the con construction stage here, we can see that the program also calculates uh, the metal deck in plane shear capacity. 
for its ability to, to provide uh, lateral resistance to the secondary beam. So as we can see now, uh, the, the deck is not, not enough uh, to provide the, the lateral uh, resistance or lateral uh, resistance to the, to the beam. So that's why the program uh, is also calculated the lateral torsion buckling uh, in the construction uh, stage. This is a new feature was introduced with the, the, the uh, renewed design check it was introduced uh, in the master series 2022. If you see the, the serviceability limit states, uh, the deflection calculations, you can see the deflection of a composite beam is of course a combination of non-composite and composite actions due to the different phases of the construction. And of course, uh, further, modi more, further modification of the deflection can due to the degree of shear connections and as we can see, for example, in, in our uh, example, we have a partial connection. So that's why the program uh, uh, slightly uh, increased uh, the deflections in, in all uh, uh, load cases. And the last check is the vibration, uh, vibration analysis. The composite module contains a check uh, on, the structure, uh, on the natural frequency. Uh, this is done using a single degree of freedom uh, approximation, and this is only for composite stage since the vibration occurs uh, in this stage. And uh, the 4 hertz uh, limit is, uh, is, is based on the SCI uh, guide, but of course, if you want, you can change it in the, in the design assumptions. Okay, so this is how the, the standalone uh, a version of the of the composite beam designer works. Let's go to the the master frame and see how the the, the integrated design works. So I have have prepared the a three D model for you. <clears throat> this model is a level of a larger frame, but to save time, I'm going to focus on this level only. And of course, this is a composite floor. But before I uh, jump in the in the design, I'm going to show you how you can set a level to a composite in the master frame. This can be done uh, uh, on the on the levels and construction default screen. So here in the level of construction screen, we, we have the options to turn on the composite pro. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a global function for the whole uh, building or the whole uh, structure. And if it's turned on, then uh, we can set the composite properties for each level. So for example, if you select the level one, which is our current level, here we can set whether a level is a composite level or not. So here we can turn on and off the composite uh, construction for each level. We can use profile and uh, solid uh, slab deck type. So now it's, it's profiled, but if you want, we can use uh, solid uh, slab as well. If you use the solid, uh, if you select the solid, then we have an option to use color core units as well. So we only need just to put in uh, the dimensions to use color core units. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, to the, to the profile version. And I'm gonna use the same multi-deck 80 I just used uh, in, the, in the standalone version. Okay, let me see what let, let, let's see what we also have here. So the slab thickness is 150. We have a one kilonewton per square meter dead load. We have a four kilonewton per square meter live load, and of course we have uh, the, the the composite loads as well. So we have uh, the construction load, mesh, and deck uh, as dead load at the van density for the wet uh, concrete. Okay. And the area loadings uh, uh, have been applied with these floor panels. So I have applied these floor panels and the, and the gray uh, arrow shows, uh, shows the, the, the spanning direction. So these are, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, this, these are the, uh, the spanning um, directions. Okay, and I also applied, sorry, and I also applied uh, semi-rigid uh, stiff deck. Uh, the, uh, to make uh, it work as one, uh, to make the the the, the floor um, work as one 
unit. Okay. So we can go ahead and analyze uh, this very quickly. So static analysis. And here you can see the load cases. The first five load cases are the generated uh, special composite load cases. The load case one is analyzed using the fully composite action. So this, the, this is the load case uh, using the fully composite action. Uh, the load case two to, to five using non-composite actions. And these load cases are used to calculate uh, the components of the deflections and of course the, uh, the ULS both in the in the in the ultimate and the service cases and from load case six onwards all, com all composite beams are analyzed using the the full composite actions of course okay space frame analysis and yeah yet i have to mention because the composite cross-section properties are calculated within the composite design uh this means prior the composite design, the properties are not known. So therefore, the first analysis run of the master frame model will be based only on the, uh, the steel section. So after the beam design is completed, we need to rerun the analysis. Okay, so before I jump uh, in the design, I would like to show that I have already introduced some design groups Sorry, this is not a design group. This one is a design group. So we have several design groups. So for example, this is an internal secondary uh, beam group. All beams in the same group are going to be designed for the same deflection limits. So here you can see we have several deflection limits for each cases. Uh, these uh, enhanced uh, cases were also uh, introduced with the 2020 version of the master series, and we have some uh, additional additional options as well. So we can we can make the stats the same for the whole group. We can make the mesh bar the same for the whole group. These are all, these are all new, uh, and were, these were introduced with the 2020, uh, 2020, 2022 versions. And we have the main section the same for the whole group. Okay. So we have an internal. Sorry, I have to move this one. So we have a, we have an internal secondary beam group. We have an edge primary, we have a short secondary beam group, we have an internal primary group, we have an edge secondary, we have the trimmers, and we have uh, a group for the cell form beams. We have some cell form beam, beams just for fun. The cell form beams have done them all individually, so these are not at the same session size. So I'm going to make the mesh rebar for the same for the whole group only. Okay, so these are the design group. So now we can go to composite steel beam composite design. Okay. So let's start uh, with the internal uh, secondary beam. So I can select if if I, if I select any of the beam uh, inside the group, then you can see all the other beams in the same group are also highlighted so we've got uh, we've got uh three five six uh one seven one ub uh sixty seven and it works of course in uh three five five still and the stat is ninety by uh one hundred and twenty five because of the of the of the deck size and yes it's, it's working so we can we can change the cross section and of course, uh, the program automatically uh, recalculate uh, the, the the design, or we can use the auto design, and we can ask the program to find me the shallowest one for all the members quickly. Or if we turn on uh, the short by weight, then you can see the program can find me a slightly lighter cross section, which works uh, for the for the for the for the secondary beam beams okay so this was and uh, this was my uh, secondary beam let's move over to the to the primary internal beams so this is the primary internal beams so as you can see we have uh we have uh two beams uh, two beams connected from both sides 
and if you turn and and if you click on the auto design the program can find me quickly and uh, the lightest uh, cross section which works so this one is the lightest the the 610178 UB uh, 82 so this is the uh, the lightest cross section okay so the, uh, these are the the simple beams but of course there are some uh, some special beams as well. For example, this is a mixed beam, the mixed internal beam. It's, it's secondary from from this side and primary from this side. And of course, we can design it as well in the master series. So if we click on the auto design, and the program can find us the lightest cross session very quickly. And yes, five three three one six five UB uh, sixty six the lightest cross section which works and we have uh, we got uh, two starts per trough so this is the end of course the mesh is the default uh, 393 okay so this was a uh, mixed primary meme if we go to the to the trimmers you can see that oops it's a very big uh, section never mind so we can see if you turn on the the gravity so this beam uh this beam is classified as an edge beam because we have area here but we have a big openings on the other side so that's why the the program classified as an edge beam and of course you can size that up to to find the uh the the, the lightest cross section so if you click on the the auto size then the program can quickly find me and the lightest cross section it's 178 uh, 102 ub uh, 19 so it's a very uh, small cross section but we have an option so for example if we want so we can ask the program to find me uh, the, the the smallest cross uh, the, the find me the lightest cross section uh, but uh, the 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 size of the the, the cross section let's say uh, 200 mil so if you click on it then you can see 203 102 uh, ub 23 is the lightest cross section in this case okay so this is how uh an edge beam uh works so let's move over to the to the cellular beams so we have some cellular beams in this model of course we can do cellular beams as well i'm sorry i turn off the the air loadings Okay, so this is a, if you see the cross section, so this cross section is a, is a 457152UB60. And, um, and that has been made uh, to a cellular uh, 571 uh, deep uh, beam, of course, and it's working. And the, and the green openings are the critical, so that are uh, physically checked, and of course uh, the the graphic is a is, is a is an interactive graphic. So, for example, if you are interested in the in the first opening, you only need just to click on it, and then the program will redirect to the the proper part of the report. So this is the this is the first uh, opening which was checked, and of course we have uh, if you if you scroll down you can see all the all the checks. Let's see uh, what we can also do here. So if you want, you can fill openings as well, what I just have done here in this case. So you have the options to fill in openings. For example, if you want to, to omit the first half meter, you can do it. So this is what I, I've done, that I have done. So uh, if, if you delete it, you will see uh, it's still working. But let's say I, I just want to omit the first uh, half meter. So let's say first half meter from the start point of the beam, and because it, it's a nine meter uh, nine meter beam, so eight point half uh, from the other side. Okay. So this was the cellular beam, and of course you can you can do auto design as well. It's a, it's a also available 
Okay, and let's see the the final um, beam type that we have in this model. This is a standard beam with these great openings. So if you have looked this one, you will see that uh, we have used the, uh, the, the discrete openings editor to create the web openings. And in this case, the bin is not dependent, of course, so because these are uh, web cutouts, so it's not uh, a cipher beam, we just uh, added uh, normal web uh, cutouts to the beam, so that's why uh, the, the sec that's why the section is still uh, a standard uh, uh, UB cross section. And of course, uh, any web openings with uh, uh, with with uh, uh, any any web openings with regular calculation uh, with with any uh, any web openings. Uh, uh, with uh, add some uh, require uh, require a calculation of uh, additional deflection. So if you add openings to the to your beam, then of course uh, your deflections uh, will be uh, modified. Okay, let's quickly see the the discrete web openings editor. So as you can see, we have a circular opening, we have a rectangular opening, and we have some elongated openings. Uh, I'm gonna just quickly delete these openings and I'm just, okay, let's apply it. And I'm gonna just deal with this circular. So in case in case of a discrete openings, you have the options uh, to repeat uh, the, the openings uh, several times. So for example, you can say that I need these circular openings 10 times. And let's say uh, the spacing is five millimeter. That's it. And here you can see these are the uh, the green ones are the the the, the, the dominant openings. So these are uh, the calculated ones. And then you can scroll down and see uh, the 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 detailed design. Okay, so that is the the, the main uh, functionality. So these are the main uh, functionalities, uh, composite design functionalities in the in the in the master series. Of course, uh, there is more in the master series. So you can do slim floor if you want. Uh, you can apply uh, pre camber uh, for non prop composite beams if you want, uh, and so on. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank everyone to attend it today. I hope you enjoyed and learned in this presentation and see you on our next webinar. If you have any questions, you can get in touch with us on our usual channel. So here you can see uh, our usual channel uh, channels. If you want to try out the software, just go to the Master Series website and fill uh, in a request to do so. And after the webinar, please do not forget to fill in a short one minute survey to let us know how you like uh, this webinar. So, thank you very much again uh, and goodbye.